So Global Drug Survey runs what I think is the biggest drug survey in the world. We've had now almost three quarters of a million people who have taken part. It's been going for eight years. The last five surveys have had about 130,000 people who have taken part. Um, the survey over the last three or four years has been translated into 18 different languages um, with partners in over 30 countries. Um, it's an anonymous online encrypted survey and it only exists because of the remarkable goodwill and generosity of loads of different people in different countries um, who spend so much time helping us create the survey and then translating it and then promoting it. Um, people who do the Global Drug Survey are a committed group of people. They'll often spend between 20 minutes and maybe 45 minutes doing the survey, answering questions on a range of things. Um, around drug use and we're independent, we're self-funded, so we ask things uh, about drugs that are kind of interesting to people who like taking drugs. And we can talk about the nice things about drugs, uh, more risky things about drugs. And what we do is produce um, a, a report every year, but as a way of saying thank you to the drug using community, we create um, free harm reduction resources that are available online to help people reflect on, on their own drug use. Um, and we publish academic papers. So this is a non-probability sample. You don't come to us for looking at prevalence of drug use. This is a group of people who like taking drugs. It's a drug survey. This is about triangulation of different sources of data. And we can answer things that other surveys can't answer because we'll have hundreds of thousands of people who've used a particular drug. One of the other reasons we get lots of people to take part is that we collaborate with big media organizations who promote the survey in exchange for us providing them with data reports. And we're very lucky because most of the organizations we work with are sensible and they publish useful, meaningful stories. Um, and we're really kind of happy about that. Um, the Lancet last year recognized the value of our work and wrote an editorial around how the way we use our information is really about changing the conversation we have about drugs. I think you can change drug laws and you can change the drugs are available, but changing drug cultures is really difficult. And I think changing the uh, conversation we have about drugs is part of that answer. The other reason that we created the Global Drug Survey is to try and dispel some of the misinformation that's out there from governments. Um, because we just want people to have access to what we think is relatively honest, credible information. And it's also challenging that whole idea that there should be zero tolerance for anything we should be aspiring to zero harm. I think there are very few things in this world that we should have zero tolerance for. There are exceptions, of course. And, and my own personal favorites is I have zero tolerance for pineapple on pizzas. I have zero tolerance for people who wear kind of socks with, um, I know this is a cultural thing, and, but anyway, um, and, 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 and clearly this guy. Aside from that, I'm pretty tolerant of most things. Um, I just want to quickly show you as one of the examples of one of the early things we did is we created a peer voted harm reduction guide called the Highway Code. We basically asked 40,000 drug users, sorry, we asked 70, 80,000 people who use drugs to tell us how they make drug use safer when they take drugs. But we didn't just ask them what strategies they used, we wanted to know how frequently they used that strategy and most importantly, what the impact was of that strategy on the pleasure that they got from taking drugs. Because you can come up with the best harm reduction strategy in the world, but if it makes drugs unfun, people ain't gonna do it. Um, and so it's kind of literally like this. There's a dial on there, which is what percentage of people um, normally follow that uh, strategy. This is um, how important it is in reducing that risk. And on here, it's a, a guide about what's the impact on pleasure. This is the one we did for LSD and magic mushrooms. Um, and I just show this to you because there is a valuable lesson that people who use psychedelics can teach other people who use drugs, which is basically people who use psychedelics are really sensible. They think about their drug experience. They plan the drug experience. They look out for each other. And we did these for nine different drugs. And what I can say is that people who use psychedelics are the most sensible, respectful group of people who use drugs. Um, one of the things that we wanted to guide everyone for was how frequently could you use a drug? For stimulants, it was often kind of leave a break for two or three weeks. And when it came for how frequently people should be taking psychedelics, I emailed Rick Doblin and I said, what's the safe time? How many weeks before between psychedelic drugs? And he very politely wrote back to me and went, this isn't about time. This is about leaving you know, 
enough time where you can integrate and learn from that experience. Um, so I'm not a psychedelic expert. But I look at psychedelic consumers and I think if other people treated other drugs with as much respect, drug use would be safer, which is a good thing. Um, one of the stories we came up with two or three years ago where everyone was really happy about because they showed that magic mushrooms are kind of pretty safe in terms of their acute risk, which is a good thing. And actually, every single year we ask people, have you turned up to the emergency department after using a drug? And for the last four years, magic mushrooms are always right down the bottom. Saying that, of course, most people are only doing mushrooms three or four times a year. So if you adjust it per episode, it's maybe not so great. But in the normal way people use mushrooms, they're pretty safe. We've done other work on novel um, psychedelics like NBOMs and 1PLSD. Um, but I just want to take you through some of the other interesting highlights before I talk around the stuff we're doing at the moment, which is around the acceptability of psychedelics in psychiatry. So LSD and other psychedelics don't lend themselves to overuse. They're not drugs of abuse or dependence. I've never in 25 years seen anyone seek treatment for dependence on the hallucinogen. The median times people use psychedelics, LSD in their life is about eight. Um, most people still take tabs uh, as their form of uh, blotter, uh, as LSD, but there's weird. Some countries really like taking um, LSD liquid in Switzerland, Austria, and Greece, uh, but not in Poland. Random interesting stuff. I don't know why. <laughs> um, this is four years ago, and we were asking people, over your lifetime, how have you used psychedelics? So this idea that microdosing is novel, it's not, I think, lots of people have understood the fact you can titrate your drug experience by how much they use. Um, we asked three or four years ago people who were using microdosing as a supplement to treating mental and physical health conditions. And what's really nice is that lots of the people were saying that they could see it contributed positively to the treatment of their condition. They didn't dismiss other treatments they were getting. I like the idea that this can augment treatment responses and overwhelmingly really positive. Is it placebo? possibly if they were taking five or 10 milligrams, micrograms. And we've looked at why people use psychedelics. There's nothing that's going to be there that is remotely exciting at all, and it's all very obvious. So I'll move on. Mushrooms. The only thing I really want to go is here. Some people really like having magic mushrooms cooked in food, particularly if you're in Colombia, but not if you're in Hungary. Again, I don't know why. It's just <laughs> random information. So more seriously, when we started doing this, um, we can't do clinical research as Global Drug Survey. We're thinking, what stuff can we do to help the psychedelic community? So as a psychiatrist, the only thing I learned at medical school about psychedelics is they give you bad trips. Like, that's it. But if you ask psychiatrists what's a bad trip, they don't really know. They just know you have to give people Valium. So I went, oh, really? A bad trip's that common? So this is the lifetime in blue, the lifetime experience of having negative or challenging experiences under the influence of different psychedelics. So the more potent the psychedelic, the more likely you are to have a negative experience. Smoke DMT, 2CB, psilocybin, really pretty low. Higher rates among life, life, more recent users, and I think that's perhaps the novelty of people starting to use drugs like ayahuasca. But is having a negative or challenging experience the same as a bad trip? So we asked people, when you had a negative or challenging experience, what was the phenomenology that made it challenging? Getting caught in a negative thought loop, confused disorientation, panic anxiety, frightening visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, sorts of schizophrenic pictures were really low. But the really important thing for us was not what to find a challenging experience, it was did people think that was a bad trip? And just under 40% said yes. Other people weren't sure. So negative challenging experience don't make a bad trip. Of course, that's why psychedelics are potentially therapeutic. How do you think people coped with having a negative or challenging experience? What do you think the most common way was? This is audience participation. Somebody needs to say something. Talk to their friends. Sorry? Talk to their friends. Yep. Or? Take another trip. <laughs> Double down. And <laughs> um, yeah, so people took support from their friends, their family, or self-management. The role of doctors and medication in this is tiny. This is in unsupervised clinical settings. So I think this is really supportive of what's going on. So 
year before last, we were really interested in losing your drug virginity. We thought that that first time is really special and a bit like your real virginity. You know, you want to lose it at the right time with the right person and sometimes that experience can be magical and wonderful and sometimes it can be a bit shit. So we were interested about people's first experience with different drugs. Um, so the first thing to say is that we got more than, sorry, two thirds of people were losing, had taken LSD for the first time under the age of 20. That's kind of young. It varied by country. In the US, a third of them were under the age of 16. But then if you woke up one day and Donald Trump was president, shit, maybe you would start <laughs> dosing. Um, this is where it gets more interesting. The idea that people fall into psychedelics without much thought clearly isn't true. Most people here always knew that they would take a psychedelic one day. You know, or they were kind of pretty certain. So more than any other drug, there are a certain group of people who kind of know the psychedelic experience is coming. Cocaine is much more spontaneous. Um, and most people are pissed when they do coke and it's entirely underwhelming. You'd think most people would be in a nice safe setting. Shit, in Finland, 20% of people took their first trip home alone. I mean, that's maybe because in Finland there's huge distances, but I'm just going, this is not good advice. You know, it's kind of... You know, you want, to, you want to be with people you like, trust, and respect. So we wanted to know, did the expectation of your first drug experience, did it match your experience? And so people expected LSD experience to be pretty awesome, and it was. <laughs> um, they kind of thought it might be really pretty scary, but it wasn't. Um, how does cocaine and MGMA fare? Actually, MGMA, people thought would be pretty awesome, and it was pretty awesome. <laughs> they thought it was going to be a bit, little bit negative, and it was a bit less negative. Cocaine, they thought, was going to be amazing, and it was slightly less amazing. So, it's really difficult. Like, drug, drugs win the war on drugs, because <laughs> people's first experience tends to be positive. Saying that, you need to take care. And so, on the back of some advice, we wrote up checklists for all of these drugs about the first time you're going to take drugs, there are some things you should put in place. And I think if you can't tick every single box on here, I don't think you should be taking LSD for the first time. LSD is not going to go away. So it's kind of when you talk to people out clubbing and they'll say, well, why did you take the extra pill? They go, well, it was in my pocket. It's like drugs don't go off. You know, it's like if you don't feel you're in the right place to take that first trip, put it back in the fridge. So last year we wanted to start looking at what the acceptability was of psychedelics and psychiatry. They'd been worked on on LSD and psilocybin, and I'm a psychiatrist, and I'm thinking, lots of my psychiatric colleagues ain't going to feel that comfortable about prescribing these drugs, and lots of my patients, I don't know. So anyway, um, first thing to show you, this is results from this year's survey. It's online. Four out of the top 10 drugs used in the world are psychedelics, eight out of the top 20. So psychedelics, I think, are on a bit of a comeback. In fact, this is a six-year trend in the UK basically up the trends in LSD, mushrooms, and 2CB. So there is definitely a renaissance, I think, in, in people using them. Um, most people who do LSD, you know, three times in the last year. Um, LSD has doubled in price. I don't know whether you guys have spotted this, but over the space of about 24 months, LSD went globally from about eight euros a tab to 16. Um, and I think that's just kind of drug dealers exploiting. I know you can get it cheaper somewhere. I know. And if you buy it on the dark net and you buy it on bulk, and I know there'll be people who are getting ripped off. This is, this is like 25,000 people. And so if you're paying less, just say to yourself, you're lucky. Um, mushrooms, again, most people do mushrooms a couple of times a year. So if there are people in the room who have used mushrooms more than... Ten times in the last year, you are in the minority. You're special. Anyway, so we collaborated with Matt Johnson at John Hopkins and Ben Sessa and Rupert McShane at Oxford. And we wanted to find out how acceptable psychedelics were as treatments. So we had 87,000 people who gave responses to their mental health history and their drug use history. So the first thing just to say is that overall of the people who responded to this section, um, just under 60% had ever done um, a psychedelic. Uh, a quarter had reported ever being diagnosed with a mental illness. 20% had ever been prescribed. And currently, about 10% of the sample were currently in a receipt 
of a psychiatric medication. The, in, the, the kind of discussion I'm going to talk about is how the influence of past experience on psychedelics and having a current diagnosis of a psychiatric illness impacts on people's acceptability of psychedelics. So, very quickly, we just asked everyone, how likely is it that you would take these different sorts of therapies? Psychiatric meds, psychedelic-assisted therapies, or talking therapies. Regardless who you are, everyone wants to talk. But there wasn't that much difference between the sample in acceptability of antidepressants or psychedelics. And there's a real worry for psychiatry where you've got nearly 35, 40% of people going, if I was depressed, I would never take an antidepressant. That story's going to get worse. However, if you had ever had a psychiatric, uh, sorry, this is in terms of acceptability of taking a psychiatric medication, depending on whether or not you've got a diagnosis. If you've got a diagnosis, you're already taking a med, people are much more likely to take it. Um, but in terms of um, psychedelic history, it didn't seem to make much difference. So people who've used psychedelics are open to the idea that maybe antidepressants might be useful. But in terms of um, taking psychedelic therapies, if you had ever you, if you'd had a psychiatric, sorry, if you'd had a psychiatric diagnosis or not, you were still open to the fact that psychedelics might be useful. So the people who you're really interested in are people who have a current mental illness, would they accept psychedelic therapies? And the answer from this is yes. And that's a really important thing. Um, the next bit that we did is that we gave people a hypothetical scenario. So for anyone who said they, it was likely or very likely or maybe that they would accept a psychedelic therapy, we gave them a hypothetical scenario um, where we asked them to think about acceptability of different drugs. So this group had much higher rates of ever psychedelic experience and 43% had a history of a mental illness. So this is a bias group. Higher rates of psychedelic experience, higher rates of mental illness. And they were given a scenario, which was basically, imagine you've got depression or PTSD, you go along to your GP and they say, look, you need some sort of treatment. And imagine that kind of cost uh, and accessibility for you, all of those things are equal. How likely is it that you would accept these different sorts of treatment? And they were given this table. And it basically takes you through antidepressants, antidepressants plus uh, CBT, psych you know, psychological therapies, psychological therapies alone, mindfulness, high-dose psychedelics, low-dose psychedelics, ketamine, high-dose, low-dose, MDMA, ayahuasca within a clinical setting, ayahuasca within a ceremonial setting. And they were given a description. And all of these descriptions were written by clinicians who had experience of delivering those treatments. And this is what we found in terms of the acceptability. So across the board, low-dose LSD and talking therapy came out top, really just followed by high-dose high LSD and MGMA. These were super acceptable. I mean, so were things like mindfulness. And across this group, with high rates of mental illness and high rates of psychedelic experience, antidepressants, whether or not you add CBT in, were the drugs that were least likely to be accepted. That's a real problem, because it actually might be this group who are going to be excluded from early treatment trials because they've got a past history of psychedelic use. But they're not going to find traditional medications acceptable. So, does the acceptability of antidepressants, does that matter whether or not you've had a psychedelic history? I mean, the answer is yes. If you've got a psychedelic history, your acceptability of antidepressants is really low. Why? Because you've taken a drug that you understand has powerful effects on your emotions, perception, and cognition that you understand would potentially be really useful as opposed to taking an antidepressant. If you'd never taken a psychedelic, the idea that you might take um, antidepressants becomes really high. So people who are drug naive, I think, are influenced by stigma and mythology around psychedelics. If you'd ever taken a psychedelic, you are absolutely going to take one of those for treatment. But you would still be open to taking antidepressants. If you'd never taken a psychedelic, there were much lower rates of people accepting these sorts of treatments. Um, we looked at ketamine because ketamine now has a license. 
in the US. Unfortunately, generally, acceptance of ketamine was much lower than psilocybin, LSD, and even ceremonial ayahuasca. Ceremonial ayahuasca came out worse than clinical ayahuasca because perhaps it's got kind of uh, overtones that people find really difficult. But if you'd never taken a psychedelic, you were never going to go, oh, I got plenty of time. Oh, actually, I could even slow down. I'm just going to, I'm, no, that's fine. I'm just going to pause for a moment. I could have paid attention, but hey, it's fine. Um, so this is a real bummer for those people who are interested in ketamine because there's a license for it. But ketamine's got really bad press, whether that's K-holes, ketamine bladder, or just as a psychedelic, people don't like it as much. It's a bit of a problem, perhaps for Janssen, because uh, they're probably hoping to make lots of money from it. Um, so this is now looking at the acceptability of these different sorts of therapy, whether or not you've got a psychedelic history or not. So what you can see is if you have a psychedelic history, every single one of the drug psychedelic assisted therapies come out much higher. Every single one of them. You know, I mean, things like, you know, high dose, uh, you know, ketamine, not as keen, but basically you are primed to accept these treatments. If you've never had a psychedelic, it's much less. It's still pretty good though. You've still got 40, 50% of people who are psychedelic naive saying, I'd be open to taking those drugs to improve my mental health. I think that's a really good thing. But Jesus Christ, antidepressants, lots of people don't like those, including lots of psychiatrists, actually. Talking hypothetically about people who have never had a mental illness is one thing. So what we are interested in is, do those people with a current psychiatric diagnosis, would those people be willing to accept medications? So here, if you've ever had um, a psychiatric diagnosis, you're very likely to accept taking antidepressants. If you're not in treatment, so these are people who have got no psychiatric diagnosis, 40% of a healthy group, if they are offered antidepressants, are basically saying, no, we don't want them. Pharma and psychiatry has a really bad problem at the moment because our most commonly used drugs are no longer seen as acceptable by many people in the population. But if you are someone who has been in current treatment, so you're currently receiving an antidepressant, you would still be entirely open to having a high-dose psychedelic. So current psychiatric treatment, maybe because it's been a bit underwhelming, does not preclude you accepting novel treatments. But the significance of this is that at the moment, most of the psilocybin and LSD trials are being offered as third or fourth line treatments for resistant major depression. I think what this says is that there's the opportunity to making these drugs available much earlier in the line of treatments. And basically, the longer you go untreated, the worse your condition gets. The more period of time you have depressed, the more likely you are to commit suicide, the longer it takes to recover. We should be looking at offering psychedelic-assisted therapies to people perhaps much earlier than many of the treatment trials are looking at. Similar story with ketamine. Um, so, you know, if you've... Uh, Got, uh, da, 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 da. there we are. So if you've got current treatment, you'd be quite open to ketamine. Ketamine just, I'm not, I'm not that impressed by people's understanding of how it works. There's going to have to be some really good marketing to patients and mental health groups. Um, but again, if you, an MDMA, lots of people would accept that. So basically, LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, and then you get ayahuasca and ketamine is really the least acceptable. That's the takeaway message. I've kind of said most of that. Um, I got ahead of myself. What's really nice is if you have a mental illness today, you're open to psychedelic therapies. But if you've never taken a psychedelic, there are things that we're going to have to change. The final thing we were interested in is, why w what were the reasons behind some people saying yes to a psychedelic and some people saying no? Um, so this is for anybody who nominated a psychedelic as their preferred choice. So the number one reason they identified a psychedelic was to get to the root of their problem. Um, followed by the fact they'd had a, you know, a past experience of psychedelics. But other things were the involvement of a trained therapist, um, how quickly the effects started, curiosity about treatment. But the thing really to pay attention to there is it's the desire to get to the root of your problem and the involvement of a trained therapist. This is what worries me about the delay in getting these um, drugs regulated for treatment because I think people therefore get encouraged to ha perhaps try and sort themselves out. 
And that's not what makes psychedelic therapies as effective as they can be. Thank you. Um, it's getting to the root of your problem and having someone trained. But what's interesting is for those people who didn't choose a psychedelic, they also wanted to get to the root of the problem. They also valued being with someone who was trained. So I don't see psychedelics as being a threat to psychiatry. I think this is actually an opportunity for psychiatrists to actually return to the job they probably hoped they would do when they started. But actually, the way we're taught to script off people and give them 10 minutes means actually lots of us can't do that job. So this, for me, is really reassuring. But for those people who didn't choose a psychedelic, there were three things that were worth looking at. People were fearful about brain damage. They were worried about a bad trip. Maybe they'd had a negative trip. There's stuff in the press that still seeps into our psyche about brain damage and bad trips. Bad trips aren't bad trips. They're negative, challenging experience, which is why these drugs are therapeutic. So I think we need some good PR, which clearly a conference like this is um, doing. Um, I think everyone's going to have to work together to kind of challenge those decades of, of misinformation in a way that doesn't swing the pendulum too far over. You know, this is not going to make an unemployed homeless injecting drug user with hepatitis C with PTSD whose life is shit. That's not going to make their life happy. Don't kid yourself. Okay? There are societal issues and the lack of ability to offer people reintegration and citizenship that tripping for 12 hours ain't going to sort out. You know? I'm sorry. There's also stigma, even among people who like using psychedelics, where... Um, People don't talk to their family members. So have you spoken to someone about your psychedelic experience? No, it would upset my family. No fear of discrimination. You know, and where people have spoken, yeah, it was a positive response. So we need to start, you know, and I'm talking to the converted, people feeling more confident to talk about what for most people is one of the most significant life experiences they've ever had. I'm just going to finish off with the last thing. My guess is when these drugs finally get licensed, they're going to cost a flipping fortune. Um, but as they stand today, um, if you compare them with every other illicit drug, LSD and magic mushrooms, according to most punters, are the best value for money drugs in the world. <laughs> and I think we should make sure that rating stays the same when they become clinically available. Um, I've got two plugs. Um, so next week, we're going to launch the UK's biggest ever cannabis survey, which is looking at medicinal cannabis, CBT, and how social clubs help people use cannabis safely. We're doing that in conjunction with the UK Cannabis Social Club. We're doing that because there's lots of money pouring into cannabis at the moment. And lots of those companies want that data, and they want to keep that data themselves so they can make even more money. And we just thought that's not the way to go. So um, we're funding this ourselves. That data will be made fully available. And... Yeah, if you smoke weed or you've done CBD and you think it's the best thing in the world, please take the survey. And if you think it's a pile of shit, take the survey as well. And then GDS 2020 launches in November. And with people like Chris Timmerman and uh, Matt Johnson uh, and Rupert McShane, this year's focus on psychedelics is exploring the whole issue of how people are currently using different psychedelics to self-manage emotional distress and psychiatric illness. And the second part of that is looking at people's experience of accessing underground therapists, whether they are traditional shamans, non-traditional shamans, or underground clinical psychologists. Um, because my real fear is that the longer there is a delay, the more we're going to have people trying to treat themselves. And the kind of temptation of going to seek underground therapists is going to lead to some bad press story, which will backfire and make the availability of these drugs less likely for those people who really need it. So we need to protect the science and protect the researchers and protect the drugs. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you.